Oh, hi there. So, uh, how was your lockdown? Because for me, it was fantastic. I went on a lot of walks. But I know you humans aren't as mentally enlightened as us doggos. You grown-ups were all, uh, and the kids, well, their lives were turned upside down. Many felt confused, scared, and anxious about the old Panny D. Cue a mental health crisis. But don't panic, because you can help. It's why I've used my powers of persuasion to gather you all here today. So without further ado, let me throw the bone to Sally and get the ball rolling. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dexter D. And thank you everyone for joining us today for today's session, which is called Happy Mind, Happy Media. And today we're talking about children's mental health and media and the impact we all have as media professionals and how we can really make a difference moving forward. That was my adorable Archie Archibald, the love of my life, my 42 kilo black Labrador. And he was my answer at Sixth Sense here where I'm managing director and we produce children's content. And during the pandemic, Archie Archibald was filmed amongst lots of other dogs. And we launched Bow Wows as a nonprofit to empower children to flourish globally. And so that's why we're here today. What answer do you have as media makers, as broadcasters, as streamers, as digital offerers? You know, what can we do to really make a difference to children's well-being? And I'm honoured to say I think I've got the most fabulous panel here today. So in no particular order, we've got Linda Semensky. Welcome, Linda. Thank you for coming here. Linda is Head of Content at PBS Kids. We all know how brilliant PBS Kids is, globally, educational, entertainment, one of the best and leading broadcasters. And I'm genuinely honored to have her here because Linda, I know how much you care about this subject. So thank you and welcome. Thanks, Sally. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And now we've got Mac Malik. Welcome from LA. Thank you for joining us, Mac. How are you? Doing well, doing well this morning here in LA. It's kind of gloomy. I guess I brought the British weather here. Thank you for joining us this early. And Mac, as many of you all know, is Head of Global Programming at YouTube Kids. And it's such an honor to have you here today as well, Mac, because I know that you're making real changes at YouTube and you've got some really interesting stuff to share with us today. And I know that you and your colleagues, I know Cedric and Craig, and I know that this matters to you as well. So I'm looking forward to sharing and hearing some more stuff from you later. Then we have Dr. Rada Modgill. Now, how do I begin with you, Rada? You're author, broadcaster, presenter, practicing GP, someone that really, really lives in that world of children's mental health and the media and that intersection between the two. And what I love about Rada is that in everything she does, she just walks the talk. She really makes a difference in every essence of what you do. So thank you for joining us here today, Rada. Oh, honestly, it's a real honor. Thank you. It's something I'm really passionate about and it's thrilling to be on a panel with these amazing people. So thank you for asking me. Oh, thank you. And last but not least, Antonio Ferreira. Welcome today, Antonio. Now, Antonio and I met a few weeks back. Antonio is on the youth board for a wonderful charity called Beyond, the children's mental health charity that I collaborate with regularly. And I met Antonio and he is genuinely an inspiration to me. And I don't use that word lightly to let you know. Antonio has real lived experience of mental illness. He is today going to share with us his thoughts on this and how the media impacted him. He's a mental health advocate, he's a volunteer. And what I love about him is his honesty, his authenticity, and his real desire to use his suffering to help others. He's here today volunteering and helping because he doesn't want others to go through what he's gone through. So Antonio, welcome to today's panel. Thank you, Sally, and that was a great introduction. You probably would have done the best introduction I've ever given myself. <laughs> you're welcome, you're welcome. And so, enough of me, but before we begin, I hope you don't mind me sharing just a few statistics, if I may, which is why we're here today. Now, we all know the figures aren't good when it comes to children's mental health, but if I may just share a couple with you. In 2020, the NHS over here in Britain said that one in six young people were suffering from a mental health disorder. That's one in six. Statistics show that since the end of 2019, that there has been a 72% increase in mental health concerns amongst children of all ages. And finally, on this panel, we've been getting so much data and research that I'd like to share with you, some of which I will, but we've been working with the fabulous Kids Insights, 
And their research showed that for 18% of 10 to 12 year olds, mental health concerns was the biggest concern. So that's the bad, and that's why we're here today, but there is good, and we're not here today to do anything but to look for the good and move forward. And the good that Kids Insights shared with me, which cheered me up as a media maker for many years, is that actually children who reported watching TV as their number one hobby were happier than those that didn't and reported other hobbies. Now, this properly cheered me up last week, I can tell you, because I want this panel to celebrate and inspire people out there. So without further ado, we will be hearing from some Vox Poppers later from other global broadcasters, but I'm going to kick off with our fabulous panel and I'm going to come to you first, if I may, Antonio. You have had a very interesting and challenging journey throughout your life. Would you be happy to share with us what you've been through, what your experience has been, and also how the media, for good or for bad, has impacted your journey growing up? Yeah, so, I mean, to begin with, I've been diagnosed with undifferentiated schizophrenia and emotional stable personality disorder. It first began when I was about 15, 16 in high school, going through my GCSEs. Had a lot of pressure from different avenues, my family, my peers, and altogether it just created a sort of ball knock-on effect of um, confidence issues and paranoia. And I was also experiencing auditory hallucinations as well. By the age of 16, I ended up being sectioned for two years, having tried to attempt suicide. Staying two years in hospital, I mean, as I tell everyone, it's a make or break situation. It's either going to tear you apart or it's going to make you someone that you never expected you to be. And I guess for me, unwillingly at the time, I chose to let it make me, to be this person that I am today, to make me this person that really wanted to encourage change and not let anyone in the same situation as me go through that alone. And I guess being from a black African background, I'm already taught to be private about my mental health. I'm already taught to be, you know, this strong macho person who can't show this weakness or sort of vulnerability. And growing up, I guess that's what the media also made me feel it had to be as. The media made me believe that these negative feelings, it was either black or white, you know, you was either this this charming man who, you know, had to be the best of the best and had no negative emotions, or if it wasn't that, then it was a really gruesome depiction of mental health, you know. You were this person with, oh, you always had your head in your hands, you always had so something very drastic going on. And when you have these expectations coming from your, your family, your background and the media, you struggle when you don't meet those expectations. And I mean, in a sense of, you know, being this macho person who's so strong and doesn't show any negative emotions so for me that's how the media impacted me negatively but we're talking at a time where you know these feelings were invalidated so when we're talking of Disney we're talking about you know if you're not this hero you're never even considered or looked at and when you are even someone from a minority background everything comes into place. So, you know, being young, being black and being mental health, I, I was depicted as this person who wasn't even considered or, you know, if I wasn't living up to a certain expectation, I wouldn't be seen or even looked at. And I think Antonio is someone that's even a different generation from you because you and I have acknowledged in our conversations that things have moved on. Even Disney moved on. All channels have moved on. And I'm going to come to Linda in a minute. But as someone that is triple your age almost, you know, I grew up with those expectations as well and, th and those images of what a woman should be like. So I really get what you're saying. Linda, things are moving on. And I know at PBS, you're a leading light, but I'm, I'm guessing you, you get what Antonio's saying. Before we move on to best practices and what you're doing there, what responsibility do you think we have in the media? Because you've straddled both commercial and now public service broadcasting. What responsibility do we have to our younger generation, do you think? Well, I, I think that that we all know in on the broadcasting side, whether it's, it's public media or or commercial media, we know that kids are learning from what they watch. And so we want the things that they learn to be positive things. And I, I see the changes happening even in commercial media where people are very aware of what they're showing and what impact it has. And it, it, in public broadcasting, we want 
our impact to be positive. So what we're trying to do, we're thinking a lot about kids' identity, and we think all the time about how every kid needs to see themselves somewhere on our air in a, in a positive way. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the audience. I think that was the biggest shift for me, for me when I moved from commercial media to uh, public media was how much time public media spends thinking about the audience and their well-being. And I felt very comfortable with that. And the goals that we have are to do very foundational things like model communications, model healthy family relationships, healthy friend relationships, showing kids talking about their feelings, showing kids handling challenging situations, showing kids uh, finding trusted adults to go to and, and talk to, and giving kids the, the, the words so that they can express themselves even at ages three or four or five. Our audience is mostly preschool, and we are trying to guide them through things like resilience and uh, through talking about their feelings and um, understanding what to do about those feelings. And I, you know, I often think about our shows as being guides to how the world works. And, and we try to present, you know, if you're feeling a certain way, you know, you can, you can talk about it in these ways. Or if your friend is feeling a certain way, what is empathy? What does empathy look like? So we focus a lot on those, uh, like on role modeling positive interactions. And to me, that's the most foundational thing that you can do for kids this age so that they start to get an understanding of, of you know, positive ways to interact with people. Thank you, Linda. And I think on that note, I'm going to hand over to the first of our box pops with Marnie from TVO, because off the back of what you're saying, she has very similar aspirations and thoughts to yourself. And Antonio, I'm hoping a bit of this might be music to your ears. Let's hand over to Marnie now. TVO Kids just um, launched a co-production, um, a TVO Kids original called How Do You Feel? And I think that's a really strong example of tackling issues around mental health. Um, it was a series where it's hosted by a young 11-year-old um, Akeem, and he each episode tackles an issue. And then the issue is discussed with Akeen. It's discussed with um, a counselor that gives him some ways of potentially reflecting and coping and strategies on how to address the concerns he has. We wanted um, a young boy intentionally so we could be showing emotional intelligence in boys, that boys can talk about their feelings, boys can represent um, ideas of kindness and concerns and problem solving around how they're feeling. But we also then expanded the casting call to look at young boys of diverse backgrounds. Because again, we thought it was a unique opportunity that we had where we could again, even going a little bit deeper beyond just showing a boy, we could have a young boy of, of a diverse background. So they could show that culturally it's okay as well, no matter who you are or what you're, where you come from and, and where you're living in Canada or around the world, that it's okay to talk about your feelings. I think that fortunately for our young um, viewers and our family members and caregivers who wanna have these difficult conversations, the permission is more there now. It's okay to talk more about it, but there's also a greater need to talk. I believe that um, you know, COVID and the isolation that our young children have felt, our recovery from it will be large for children. They're not, why would they trust the world? They've been told to, you know, to not hug people, to be careful, you know, how close they get to anybody, to stay home. They haven't seen even their own family members um, for far too long, or certainly here in Canada for far too long. Thank you so much, lovely Marnie, for those words of wisdom. And Mac, I'd like to come to you next, because as Marnie is saying, the conversation is changing. You know, we've got the bad of the past year, but there's also a change, I believe, in, in the tone of the conversation and what children are talking about. May I ask you your insights from YouTube? Because I know you've many. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think what we saw with COVID is parents recognizing these emotions that kids are having. And you saw last year when we went through the shutdown uh, in March, you saw a spike of searches for mindfulness for kids. And that spike went dramatically high in March and has now been a steady state throughout the year. And creators are leaning into that. Uh, we had a Headspace partner up with Sesame Street 
uh, to be featured on YouTube, really talking about monster meditation, right? A kind of show to help kids breathing exercise, express their emotion. And one of their most famous shows uh, of that episode was Good Night World, which got 12 million views. And as a result, Sesame and Headspace are now creating a new podcast called uh, uh, Good Night World series starting out this August. And, you know, other creators are leaning into this. We saw a real lean into this, what we call see then do, kind of what Linda was talking about, see that be kind of aspect is this interactivity where kids wanted to be see themselves and do those activities and, and when it comes to mindfulness that includes exercises which uh, increased by 4x you saw creators like joe wicks in the uk became the world's pe coach uh, get, uh generating almost 1 million views uh then you saw cosmic kids yoga a channel that's been around since 2012 spike getting almost consecutively on 1 million views per day and really being a teacher for kids on how to express their emotions, how to tame themselves, how to understand their feelings. And I think this is where you see that pivot where a lot of parents are recognizing their kids are feeling this anxiety and rather than try to protect them to the world, enable them to actually see themselves in the world and express their emotions. Thank you, Mac. And I think that that's my observation as a program maker and, and as someone that's passionate about mental health, that conversation and, and, and that openness and the empathy has been changing. One of the things rather that we did was we work with a mental health charity called McPenn, Mental Health Research Charity, and we did a, a small survey amongst young people. And I'm really interested in this in this intersection between comparison and connection, because the young people that spoke to us were saying that on one hand, the media is fabulous. And, and of course, social media is prominent in their minds when it comes to comparison, unrealistic expectations of what they should be like and who they are and what they look like. But also on the flip side, what they're telling us is for sure, as I've shared with all of you, they want to embrace new technology. They want to be embracing our content, YouTube's content, gaming. It's here to stay. We're moving forward with it. And so what is that balance between comparison and connection? And importantly, Radha, I know you've had a really interesting experience this last 15 months. How have you found it? Because it is shifting, but this is a gray area, as, as Antonio says, separately. It's a nuanced area. What have you been finding? Yeah, so I mean, I started off in broadcasting about 12 or 13 years ago now. And previous to the pandemic, some broadcasters and some platforms were absolutely fantastic. Uh, when I went to them with ideas or their ideas that they came to me with about mental health, about emotional well being, they're absolutely brilliant. And I've done some amazing content that I'm really proud of being part of. Some, however, um, were less than great. Uh, there was a lot of reluctance to hear ideas. Um, when I mentioned the words mental health, a lot of broadcasters or platforms got turned off by those words, even in themselves, without even hearing anything else about the idea. Um, interestingly, some people reflected back to me that they thought that people didn't want to hear about that. They didn't want to hear about happiness or about mental health. Um, so that was an interesting insight as to what the uh, commissioners were thinking the audience actually needed or wanted, for example. Um, there's there's a lot, there's been a lot of concentration on physical health, but a massive reluctance, I feel, um, previous to this, to, to focus on the everyday mental health. So, you know, we would often see perhaps a documentary or a news article or a news piece, for example, on grief, on loneliness, on a mental health diagnosis, particularly at times of Mental Health Awareness Week, you know, a one-off week in the year, for example. Um, but when I went to different people about focusing on grief and loneliness and self-esteem the rest of the year, um, there was a lot of reluctance to actually go there and, and to actually kind of develop ideas around that. So I thought it was interesting around how how people think about what the audience actually needs and wants, uh, for example. I think other obstacles that came up that people were saying to me, mental health is not visual enough, it's not going to be engaging on a visual platform, it's going to be heavy, it's going to be um, quite dark. I think also sometimes it was seen as a tick box. You know, we've done that, tick box, we've done that for the year and now let's leave it. And even with some of the mental health programming um, that I've seen, you know, the, the amount of promotion and the promo that goes along with it is vastly reduced compared to some of the physical health programming for children and young people um, and some fear around language. Um, and I, I really agree with what Antonio was saying about um, you know, children and young people 
they want to feel heard, they want to feel listened to, they want to feel valued. And that goes for their mental health. Their mental health is everything. It's their perception of who they are in the world, what they can do in the world, and what the world can offer them and how connected they are to the world. So I think it's really interesting thinking back to before the pandemic about where these prejudices and some of these stigmas were coming from, from the adults, as opposed to the children. Um, but interestingly, and this has been really great, you know, since the pandemic has, has happened and during uh, coronavirus, one of the good things that's come out of that is that platforms have been much more open to covering things like grief and loneliness and anxiety and low mood. And you know, thank goodness for that, because we've all been affected by that as a world. We, you know, most of us were anyway, but this has actually given us a space and some momentum to actually build on positively to move forward. Um, but again, even within that pandemic period, um, again, when things were kind of getting bad in terms of pandemic, I would get approached in a, a huge flurry of, of, of requests for interviews. And then when things kind of got slightly better, then that would be forgotten. So again, it's a little bit of a fluctuating thing. And I'm really keen to see it not as an up and down, but as a constant that really reflects people. Um, I've been doing a lot of my own social media around sort of um, the pandemic on my own Instagram channels, for example. And really what I found was, is that people just wanted a human face and a human voice. And someone sent me a lovely comment on there saying something like, you've humanized help. And I thought that was really powerful because actually when we, when we think about mental health for children and young people, we want them to feel like it's part of them because it is. We want them to feel like it's human. Thank you, Roger. And we're going to move on to the good stuff now because I, I, I want this session to be about that. But it's really interesting what you're saying because that's been my observations as well. You know, the language that you use, Antonio and I have talked about this, you know, the fear of the word death, the fear of the word suicide, the fear of the word grief. Um, and for me, we've already got a mental health commission. The same. Oh, it's rather boring, isn't it? Exactly what you said. I mean, so suddenly I've got my comedic talking dogs, which I love, by the way. And it's great. But mental health isn't boring. Children love it. Our brain is fascinating. Neuroscience is fascinating. We should be approaching this with fun. All of the mental health organizations I work with, it's a positive subject. And we need to have that attitude is how I feel. But enough from me, we're going to hear from some more global broadcasters, a couple of box pops. I'm going to hand over to Darren now, who's going to tell us a little bit about ITV. I think the last year especially has been incredibly difficult for a lot of families. It's been quite uh, filled with a lot of anguish uh, and difficulty. Um, and, and for us, it's about improving the mental health of not just kids, but the, the whole nation. Um, on Specifically on kids, we have been changing the way we talk to kids in our scripts and, and the way we interact with kids and, 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 and the way we, we, we portray certain scenarios and, and how kids can deal with certain things. Um, that can certainly be seen in some of the new commissions. It would start with us, you know, with the execs really flagging, is that storyline healthy? Is that, uh, you know, um, supporting kids' mental health? Is there, uh, you know, something here about body image that could be changed to make it more positive for kids? Um, is it really authentic if we are seeing a storyline that is talking about mental health? Is it really authentic or is it just paying lip service to it? The next stage, of course, is working with um, professionals in the field of mental health, children's mental health, uh, educators and uh, frontline medical workers, making sure that um, we're actually getting, um, you know, um, a real sense of how we could um, improve those storylines or themes or characters. Um, we're, we're doing that right now with a show that we have, um, you know, just recently greenlit, um, where we're working with uh, different mental health agencies to make sure that stories are supported. But I do think it really starts with uh, working with the kids themselves, whether it's uh, making sure that we're really connected to young kids and families, and making sure that we're really listening to tweens about what's going on with them, um, and not assuming what the issues are from our perspective. Um, and our team is very connected that way through regular research and, and contact with kids themselves, hearing what the issues are and then getting scaffolding and supporting from, um, from professionals in that area. 
Oh, thank you, Marie. It's lovely to see the great work that's been doing done globally. Mac, can I come to you next? Because I know you've got lots in the offing at, at YouTube, and I'd like to hear some real positive stuff, which I think is exciting that we can embrace as content makers. Because in the past, there's been bad rap coming your way. And, and let's yeah. talk about some of the inspirational things moving forward, if we may. Well, I think you, you heard it from the previous conversation. Like last year was a tough beat for everyone. But what it also taught us is that our world are, is blend, uh, blending together and that the offline interactivity that we have can also be in, engaged online. And this, you have a generation of kids who are now moving where they spent a year being taught via Zooms and all this different type of way. And then the, they, when they search for content, when they're trying to learn things or see things and learn things like they're searching on YouTube kids and like finding it out what's happening around what, what's reflecting that. And I think that's what you're seeing. And I call this like edutainment type content where kids can really find content that teaches them. One of my favorite ones is a Monica Sutton, who's a former preschool teacher who turned her circle time, like what she did in the classroom online. And then now is generating hundreds of thousands of views, helping kids not only learn the alphabets, but also how to tame their emotions. And she intersperses this in this way. And that's why at YouTube, we've invested almost a hundred million into kids content for a content fund, really trying to find that co content that is entertainment, educating, enriching, and represents the world we live in. And our first series with Super Sena really demonstrated that with a you know, superhero story from an African woman really protecting her village and things like that. But it also deals with emotions and, and things like that. And that's kind of what we're looking for when we talk about the future. And Mac, everyone's going to be interested in this. Is it just the big players that have access to this wonderful fund of money? Or, or is it some of the smaller media makers and independents as well? Because I know everyone's going to excite, get excited about this funding that's available. Is it easily accessible for us all, Mac? First of all, it is something where we're looking at across the board. We're looking for that, as I mentioned, ed edutainment, rich and, and engaging content. Super Sama was a channel that was 2,000 subscribers when we found and leaned into that. We've gone with Soul Pancake, another channel with only 5,000 subscribers and build out a show called Kid Correspondent. But we've also worked with Pink Fong, a large creator of, we all know, Baby Shark as well. So we span the gamut. And what we're looking for is what it was I was mentioning, you know, those pillars that, the, what represents the world for kids? Does it provide enriching and educating con uh, uh, kind of content. And I, I think our YouTube Originals team seeks out that. Thank you, Mac. Antonio, may I come to you next? We've heard what Mac's doing. I'd like to get your overview because I know you so much wisdom about how we media professionals can really make a difference with our content. Would you be happy just to share some of your thoughts that you've already shared with me about things that we can grasp hold of that we might think we're doing, but we could do better? Yeah, I mean, firstly, to, to begin with is is what what you've said and what everyone else has said. It there has been progress, and you know, times have shifted, and things have been more and more recognised. Um, just to put that into perspective, with my distrust from the media. So I'm 23 now. I had mental health since I was 15. I've been watching TV since I don't know, God knows how long. But my distrust comes from that time. That I've, from when I've been watching um, TV and shows that now, even now, when I hear or see any type of show that tries to depict mental health, I'll turn off that TV straight away because I just have so much distrust in the fact that how will it be portrayed? Will it be authentic or will it actually depict what mental health is? But in contrast to that, that's also why I've chosen to be a, a lived experience media volunteer because I know with the mass audience, the media is where I'm going to get most of um, people's attention, as long as they're not like me that turn off that TV, because there has to be role models in media. There has to be that, you know, that person who's willing to share as much as they can. And even within production, you need to have people by your side who are media volunteers because they are experts by experience. They will be able to tell you how something should really look or how something actually feels. And that's what I think makes the big difference because people can tell when something's not authentic or when you're just doing it as as said to just as a, as a tick off 
when a child asks, why does that person look sad? We brush that off and we're like, oh no, they're not sad. They're just, you know, we're, we're, we're invalidating other feelings or possibilities that kids have these other um, emotions. It, you know, it's not just, not every day is going to be sunshine and lollipops. You are going to have those cloudy days, but also reminding them that clouds do pass. And that's the main thing. Clouds do pass, but clouds do present themselves. And I think, thank you, Antonio. And I think that's why we're here today, to listen to your voices and to hear this. And I think, as you're saying, to integrate this lived experience through all of our content, because a lot of what we've talked about so far is specific mental health commissions. But actually, as Radha was saying, it's the subtleties of the language that we use. It's okay not to be okay. You know, that that thing where it, it's so many of us do it. You know, someone's unhappy. Oh, come on, come on, watch your film. Don't be unhappy. But it's okay not to be okay. As you say, the cloud will pass. And how do we, in our subtle messaging, I, I'm passionate about the power of our language. And Linda, I'd like to come to you on that because you do have best practices at PBS. I've, tr I've chatted to you. And my experience as a media maker is I work with multiple academics, multiple consultants, but I also work with young people across the board from young to old. And there is nothing like the voice of someone like Antonio supporting my work. How do you approach it at PBS? Because I know you've got a really interesting approach to all the content that, that, that you offer. We do work with advisors uh, for everything. We start with uh, frameworks that we uh, work with advisors to put together about what we want to cover in different topics, different shows. And then we have a social emotional framework that we ask to be incorporated into all of our shows. And that's really so that kids can understand their feelings and articulate their feelings and explain their frustration with things or to, you know, to work with, you know, building resilience, things like that. And we have a lot of stories that are really real. They're based on what kids are dealing with. Uh, I think one of the most popular ones is a Daniel Tiger's Neighbor episode where uh, Daniel's baby sister, Margaret, is born. And instead of being happy, he's, he's frustrated because he's not getting any attention. Uh, he can't do the things he wants to do. He has to be quiet. He doesn't feel particularly good about any of this. And it, it, the show kind of takes you through Daniel's frustration. And, you know, it, it's become a, uh, a very popular show for parents to show their kids when they're about to become a big sibling because it talks to them about what they can do and that things will be different, but what they can do to feel better about things while, you know, while they're waiting. And it's very effective because kids, like I said, they're looking for this guide to how the world works and they're being given a possibility for what they can do to deal with this frustration that they're feeling during what's supposed to be a happy time. So we have a lot of episodes of different shows that are like this. Daniel is you know, a, a particular uh, show where it really does take on a lot of strategies for how to deal with the feelings that you're feeling. Um, we have a new show, Don Quixote. It, it focuses on resilience. Um, the idea being that you know, you're going to want to do a lot of things and they're not going to turn out the way you had imagined. So you know, how to recover from that, how to just accept that you know, like trial is part of the, the, the process and that you will eventually uh, figure things out and resilience is going to be a big part of what you're dealing with. But we work with so many, so many advisors to guide us through how to talk to kids, uh, you know, how to, how to understand what they're feeling. And we talk to kids. We do a lot of focus groups. We do a lot of um, research where we understand what kids are thinking about, how they're feeling. We talk to their parents and we try to capture all of that. And we try to offer uh, scenarios for kids so that they understand what they're feeling. And, uh, and, and just if, if kids can understand how to talk about things, then you know that's that's a big piece of it for us. Thank you, Linda. And finally, Rada, just over to you as someone that straddles both worlds and is an expert of both. Could you end up for us giving us some real sort of thoughts and summarizations as to what we can take home and take away? We've heard lots of great, great tidbits from, from everyone on the panel, but could you just sum up your wish? for us as media professionals moving forward when it comes to children's mental health. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's interesting to think about three or four things. So the first is fear. 
often we don't do things because we're frightened of something. Now, is that fear about language, not being, not really understanding about language and, and the kind of language to use, in which case ask people with lived experience, ask the experts. Is it fear around um, how that will be received by uh, the family unit or the wider society or, or judgments about that particular piece of broadcasting? How can you get around that fear or dispel that fear or be aware of the fear and why it's there? And actually, is it a real fear or is it just a perceived fear? I think that's really important to think about why we don't do things and then flip that on its head to see how we can do them. I think it also is about um, seeing the opportunity, you know, in a in a crowded space where broadcasters are trying to get you know, children and young people's attention, see the opportunity, see the creativity that can come from that with visuals, with learning about the brain, with learning about emotions, with all these amazing graphics and amazing things you can do in such creative ways and encourage children to be creative in how they interact with that programming, for example. I think really important to think about threading mental health and emotional well-being through programming and not boxing off into a corner and treating it like the poor relation that needs to be done done once a year for example so really think about in your dramas how are you threading that in in your entertainment how are you threading that in again is a really really important one i think also when we're looking at things like dramas and other types of programming um think make make sure it's realistic and authentic so for example um you know if, if there's a soap opera doing a piece about a character who's got ocd for example you know sometimes what we tend to find is that that's that storyline is covered for sort of two weeks and, and then that character never has a relapse never has difficulties never has challenges with that again and so what we need to see is that that storyline and that authenticity and that realism to do with mental health is carried through that character's progression not just for a short period of time and I think also um, see the joy in 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 mental health programming and content because there's so much joy in there, and I think as as Linda mentioned about empathy, connection, community, understanding other people's feelings, all of our mental health helps us bring other people's mental health towards us, and vice versa. Thank you, Roger. I have to say, since I've been working in mental health for the past ten years, it has brought the most joy anyone could ever bring to my life. So I wholly agree with you, Linda. What would your top tip be as we depart from this wonderful session for for us media professionals out there? I think the the best thing that we can do is is normalize the discussion about mental health. If we can talk about it, and if we can talk about it more, and we can talk about how we're working it into our shows we can help eliminate the stigma just by by talking about it and and telling people letting people know that this is important to us thank you mac over to you your top tip i think just to recognize that you know last year over 1 billion kids were at home and we all were with those kids and we as adults had anxiety we had worry and we wore it on our face and kids saw that. And it is, you could see in this generation, they do not want to be shunned away or coddled or in a way hidden from the real world that they live in, right? The, the rise of racial inj injustice, the, the anxiety of COVID, all of this demonstrates that we need to be transparent. We need to recognize kids' emotions and we need to uplift it in a positive manner. And uh, it's, it's exactly what Antonio and Linda say is authenticity matters, but consistency matters. And really recognizing that you continually bring this up, up out. And the beautiful thing is we live in a digital world where you could do it in so many ways, even including, you know, doing it with your own dog and creating videos like that. Any which way you could uplift it is the way to bring it to kids. Thank you, Mac. Thank you so much. And a final word to you, wonderful Antonio. What would your top tip be as we close the session? This event where we are here now, we've got someone such as myself from a lived experience um, aspect being heard by people in all different sections of broadcasting. And that in itself shows that people are willing to hear out what's gone wrong and are willing to make that change to how can we improve? You know, when you're in high school, or at least in my high school, the way I was, my work was always marked was what went well and even better if. And I think right now, right here, that's what's going on. We're discussing what's, what is going well. And we're also looking at even better riffs. And that is the same page as I think, listening to everyone um, speaking about um, the media. It makes me joyful because it's like, as I said, I lost trust in the media in the past, but now it's like, you know what? 
I'm ready to give an opportunity again because I can see that there is this change and difference and positivity coming along. Oh, thank you, Antonio, so much. Thank you, everyone, so much. I guess my little top tip as we depart is to all take care of your own mental health as well. As someone that's worked in this area for a long time, I think there is nothing like taking care of our colleagues' mental well-being, looking after our teams, making them as healthily mental as we can be. And for me, that filters through all of our content. If we're healthy and happy as much as we can be, then that will shine through all of the content that we make. And on that note, we have touched upon a couple of sensitive issues today. So please, if you are struggling in any way, please know here in, here in Britain, the Samaritans are there for you 24-7. Their number is 116-123. That's 116-123. And also we have the wonderful film and television charity that also is open 24-7 to give you counselling advice. And their number is 0800 054 0000. That's 0800 054 And if you're in another country, we will be sharing some other numbers on our platform. And please do remember there is always someone out there to talk to and to listen to you. So thank you, my wonderful panelists. It's been a true honor speaking to you all today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for hopefully inspiring our audience. And may we go forth and make a real difference in the world. And I'm going to hand over finally to the love of my life, Archie Archibald Acker, Dexter D. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. So what do you think? How can we turn this crisis around and get kids' tails wagging again? As media professionals, we can make a massive impact. So be thoughtful, be compassionate, be kind, and, well, be a bit more like a dog. Unless you're next to a lamppost right now, in which case, hold it in. What are you, an animal? Now, go get creative. Go spread happiness. Woohoo!